Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Strong. I'm a tech editor based in New York City. And we are here to talk about all things quantum computing. These two gentlemen come from different backgrounds, approach it from, well, hardware and software. But I'll let them introduce themselves if you want to. Great. So I'm Chris Ballins, co-founder and CEO of Oxford Ionics. So at Oxford Ionics, we build the world's highest performance quantum computers. So what we've worked out how to do is build out chips on a standard semiconductor fab that can run at room temperature and are already produced alongside chips for laptops, cell phones, and high-performance computers on dinner plate-sized production wafers. And we've recently demonstrated that on these systems, we can get quantum performance that's not just comparable to the state of the art, but it's nearly an order of magnitude beyond that. I'm Joe Fitzsimons. I'm the CEO of Horizon Quantum Computing. Um, what we do at Horizon is solving what we think of as one of the two main problems with getting to useful quantum computing. So the first is what Chris does, making hardware that's actually capable of performing quantum computation. We do the other side of this, building the software development tools, building the algorithms to take advantage of these systems. All right, so from each of your perspectives, what is the state of the industry right now? So perhaps I'll start. One of the things that I really firmly believe is that we know what we want to do with quantum computers. If we can build hardware that performs well enough, we can completely change the kind of problems we can compute in the world. Things like building out better batteries, building out uh, better drugs. All of these problems are problems of solving problems that we can't solve on classical compute right now. And we're just starting to see the hardware come online that allows us to start properly tackling these problems. Right. It doesn't require absolute zero. Or <laughs> yeah. For you? So uh, from my perspective, there's been a lot of change over the last year. Um, we've seen quite a lot of advances, both in terms of hardware and in terms of software. Uh, in particular, we've started to see error correction really demonstrated for the first time, which has been basically a major milestone for the field for 25 years. Like, If you can get below a particular error rate, then we know it's possible to use software to correct those errors. But getting below that error threshold is really, really difficult. And we've seen this demonstrated now for the first time. OK. So we've seen. Oh, this works. Um, yeah, so we've seen error correction demonstrated for the first time this year. We've also seen a lot of advances in terms of the theory of error correction, so we can get to much lower overhead uh, in terms of the kinds of size of systems we need to build before we start to see an advantage. Yeah. I mean, in the time that I've been covering quantum, which is very part-time, I mostly cover AI, but in the time that I've been covering quantum, I would say there's been this hurry up and wait <laughs> feeling about it all. But I, for me, I feel there's a vibe shift, especially around error correction at this time. And I'm kind of curious to hear you unpack that, how you feel. Yeah, so I think maybe 2020 to 2022, there was a lot of noise in quantum about maybe we can do really interesting stuff with the hardware we have right now, with this noisy, crappy, baby hardware. And the answer was pretty clear, no. But at that point, we got to a pretty good set of homework problems we had to solve. We had to work out how to make these devices more reliable. We had to work out how we can make these devices scale. So where you could build devices that are factor 2, a factor 10, a factor 100 bigger without having to reinvent the wheel. And we had to find ways of doing this while also reducing the errors. And what we've seen just over the last 12 months is lots of different companies, including mine, hit these different milestones with really promising different approaches. And it's really a really exciting time since it feels like all of these big problems are now suddenly starting to, starting to see massive progress on. So there's been a massive change on boots on the ground, and we're just starting to see this leak out into the wider world now. So um, I feel like I really uh, intimately understand the Gartner hype cycle now because the, there was quite a lot of hype. Uh, about potential applications for quantum computing, in particular about very short-term hopes for advantage with noisy and perfect systems that existed, and as Chris says, maybe 2020, that kind of time. Um, and what we've seen is, well, first of all, those approaches don't really work very well. It, it's become much clearer that we need to get to lower error rates. We need to start doing error correction. Quantum computing is you're trying to perform computation with very, very fragile physical systems. So the state of the information in the system can be very easily disrupted. You know, a photon might escape from the system and you lose information that way, or a cosmic ray comes in and hits something and that 
uh, that causes degradation of your information or many other possible mechanisms. And because of this, quantum, com uh, quantum computers, quantum processors as we have today, they're occurring, well, errors are occurring in them very regularly. So maybe one in a hundred operations you would try to do, you might get an error out. And when I started my PhD, it was more like seven, and, uh, more like three and ten. But, you know, and I guess for Chris, it's much less than one in a hundred. But we're starting to get towards this regime where that error rate is less. And once it drops below a critical threshold, it turns out we're able to use error correction protocols to correct the errors as they occur. And if you can do this fast enough, if you can bail the water out of the boat fast enough before it fills up, you're fine. You can, you can work just as if you had no error at all. But if you are not below that threshold, if you are not bailing fast enough as the water comes in through the hole in the boat, then you sink. And so that's why error correction is so important. It's why it's been a major milestone for the field, and it's why it's really, you know, passing that milestone is, a, is really heralding a new stage of readiness for quantum computing. Yep. All right, so a lot of progress, also a lot of challenges that remain. What are some of your biggest challenges right now that each of you face? So I, I can speak on the hardware side, then Joe can speak on the software side. On the hardware side, it's a lot about finding the right way to get customers to adopt this. You know, like we've seen with AI, there's a very sharp switch from it does nothing of value to suddenly it generates massive amounts of value. And working with customers to find the right way to start learning how to do this. So lots of these systems we sell right now can't outperform your iPhone, right? They're crap computers compared to a large-scale supercomputer. But the progress and of the power of quantum computers over classical computers is exponential. So a couple of generations time and about 18 months, you go from not being able to outperform an iPhone to not being able to, for a quantum computer to outperform a planet-sized classical computer and to be more powerful than any classical computer you could ever build over the lifetime of humanity. And getting customers to really understand what that means and that they have to start developing applications now and working on how they build out pipelines now, massively important. In a moment, I'm going to ask you two to unpack some of that, because probably people are here in part because they want to know what they should be working on next. But Sure. So I mean, at least from our side, from the more software perspective, uh, the thing to understand is this is really, it's not like computing in 1978. It's like computing in 1948. Um, we have nothing. So we have to build the entire edifice of modern computer science from scratch. We don't have operating systems. We don't have high-level programming languages. We don't have the runtime environments to execute them. Quantum programs that we execute today are usually constructed one logic gate at a time. So if you have to go about building complex software, and the way you did that was by basically having to design a processor, designing, I want a NAND gate here and another NAND gate here, that would be really problematic. It would be very difficult to get to the kinds of, the kinds of sophisticated software applications we're used to today. So at least what we're trying to do is to bridge that gap, to learn the lessons of 80 years of you know, computer science in more like eight years for quantum computing, to get to a point where we make quantum computing much more like conventional computing, that developing for these systems is easier. But today, if you look around the field, even if you look at research, very few people even work on data structures, which is fundamental to algorithms design in, in the classical world. So we, we have a long way yet to go. There's a lot to be discovered, but that also makes it really a promising area to be in. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of blank canvas. I feel like there's two things that go you know, kind of hand in hand here. One would be, what are the things you wish were better understood, but also by perhaps people gathered here, and also what advice can you impart to those gathered here to, for this type of preparation that you described. Yeah, so one of the things I'd just add on to Joe's point is it very much does feel like we're trying to speed run the whole of classical computing, right? We've seen over 70 years how computing's changed the world, and we're now coming in with a prepared mind and saying, how can we shortcut all of that crap? Like, how can we get right to the end goal at the end of generating all this value as fast as humanly possible and do all of these different things in parallel, which is kind of quite adrenaline-filled. The really interesting way is, you know, thinking about what quantum computers actually give us. And the wrong way of thinking about them is just like, faster classical computers. The right way of thinking about it is that there's so many problems out there that we can't solve on conventional computers. And we can take stuff that 
currently requires someone to go into a lab to get, go and test a new battery chemistry, and we can take those kind of problems and instead move those onto computing. So you know, you can kind of glibly say there's a good reason why uh, NVIDIA has a three and a half trillion dollar market cap, right? They found a way of making compute about 10 times better than any other way. And that 10x margin on compute power drives that whole market cap. With quantum computing, we can solve problems millions or billions of times faster than you can on a conventional computer, which takes problems that would take a thousand years or a million years, so completely intractable on an old computer into something you can then solve in a meaningful time frame. Although, at least until now, that's been can solve dot, 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 eventually. Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, it's still true. Uh, we haven't yet gotten to the point where quantum computers are actually really useful for solving real world problems. We're still some way away from that, and that's why things like error correction are very exciting, because we can see ourselves getting much closer to that regime where they are actually useful. But they work in a really fundamentally different way than conventional computers. And the way conventional computers work is actually pretty similar to the way you and I might work if we were trying to do a calculation with a notebook, something like that. You read a bit of information into your brain, you make a simple manipulation, you record the result, and you can go back and forth this way. With a quantum computer, it works by doing interference between different possible branches of the computation, and we just don't have first-hand experience of this. So building up the intuition to actually make use of that is really difficult. So our, our focus is on trying to abstract that away, trying to build software development tools where you don't need to worry about quantum physics in order to be able to still get the acceleration from quantum computing. But the reality is that's a really big challenge. We do need to be able to figure out how do we make use of quantum computing. But the promise of it is that it's potentially computing all over again, just as conventional computers brought you know, problems that would otherwise have been completely intractable into the realm of the possible. Quantum computing will do that again with another big swathe of problems that are currently entirely outside our reach. Now, you know, Chris focused entirely on this. I think there's a lot of ones that use HPC today that will also benefit. But I think the most interesting applications are those that are currently far beyond our reach. Being able to step away from wet lab experiments in chemistry and being able to apply machine learning techniques to iteratively, uh, to iteratively redesign experiments, for example, or being able to do the same with turbulent fluid flow in, um, in uh, computational fluid dynamics if you're trying to design an airplane or something like this. Right. Being able to take away the wind tunnel, being able to take away the lab and move it into the computer is really transformative. So in fairness, it is actually fun to go visit the wind tunnel sometimes. But anyway, <laughs> and to see all these things. The, um, and, but to your point, the we can drive cars without knowing how the engine works necessarily or being able to build it ourselves and eventually you will find ways for others to participate in this without having necessarily a quantum physics background, perhaps. So, um, You alluded a bit to the research and the breakthroughs of recent years. Are there particular things that you want to expand upon like that you're more excited about than others? What I'd add to that is that we're now seeing quantum computers becoming simpler. And this sounds counterintuitive, right? As you build better hardware, it becomes more complex. Actually, generally, when you look at the world, that's not true. The first of anything always looks really complex. It has lots of bells and whistles on. Then as you start working on iterating and designing it, suddenly you end up with something simpler. And ultimately, anyone can build a complex technology. And the real challenge is finding ways to strip out this complexity and make things simple. But there's only really simple things that you can then scale and build out. And we're now starting to see this trend happening with quantum computing. You know, Five years ago, it was a massive stretch to make something work. And you had companies out there building a quantum computer. And now people are way beyond that. The technology just works in the lab, and people are now sweating on, how do you go about mass producing this? How do you go about optimizing yields? Sure, this technology works, but the unit economics are crap. How do you go about optimizing that and actually make it saleable? How do you start getting these things out there? How do you think about optimizing between size, weight, and power? and deployability and upgradability. And that, to me, is the really exciting metric, showing that you're actually getting close to mark and you really do have this technology properly taking off. For you? At least from my perspective, there's been a lot of progress. And the progress in error correction and other areas is really fascinating. The performance increase in the different hardware platforms is fantastic. But for me, there's two interesting developments in industry uh, that are actually starting to really 
impact us. So one is the emergence of a kind of open stack for quantum computing. Um, and we're taking advantage of this. This basically means there's different parts of systems being built by different providers. Uh, and they're somewhat interoperable. Uh, so it means that we're able to go get a QPU from one provider, we're able to get a fridge from another, we're able to get a uh, control systems from another and piece them together without too much, without reinventing the wheel. Uh, and we're able to get a system up and running. So we've kind of taken advantage of this. We've set up a hardware test bed. We're putting together the first system at the moment. Um, but the other side of this, I would say, the other thing that's really interesting to me is that we're starting to finally move beyond quantum circuits. So the way quantum programs work, uh, for the most part, for you know all of the time there have been cloud-based systems, has been that you specify a list of operations and they execute one after the other, and then you're done. There's some measurements at the end. But actually, if you want to do a, a, write a more general program, and the way everyone's computer, everyone's mobile phone, everything works today, it has the programs have loops in them. So they have more complex control flow than this. You have to be able to take some steps, do some operations, make a measurement, and then decide what to do next. And you know, for the longest time, that's been basically impossible in these systems. And it's starting to become possible now. I know it's true that if you're in a, a, an ion trapping group, for example, you can build a system to do this yourself. But actually, the, the ability to do it in commercial systems is really important and really interesting development from my perspective. Absolutely. Thank you both very much. I can't believe we're already out of time. And thank you all for being here. It's really great. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Sure.